But to one life of their is generation. It is like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came, neither eating nor drinking, and they said, He has a demon. The Son of Man came, eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to Christ. The children put some forward for our children's message. And let's pray. Gracious and, and loving Father, be pleased to be with us now as we reflect upon your word. Grant that the words of my lips and the meditation of our hearts would be truly pleasing in your sight. Amen. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another, We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came, neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. And the Son of Man came, eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Here, Jesus makes reference to a common game played by most Palestinian children in the first century, singers and mourners. It was sort of like our modern game of, of, of Simon Says. Uh, the idea was this, the children would pick a leader and he or she would pretend to play a pipe or uh, to, to mourn. And depending on which the leader would choose to do, the children either had to respond by, by jumping up and joyfully dancing and singing, or by crying and wailing like mourners at a Near Eastern funeral. Whichever child failed to do so quickly enough was out of the game. So Jesus' point here is simple enough. People are so self-absorbed, trying to run their own lives, they cannot take time for God's reign, God's rule, breaking into this world. It, it, it's kind of like Frederick Buechner said long ago. It's not that they're kept out of the kingdom as much as it is they cannot see the kingdom as a place worth getting into. And so, and so they avoid God by complaining about the messengers. The ones complaining uh, about both John the Baptist, the one who came mourning our sinfulness and seeking a way uh, of fasting and repentance, and Jesus, the one who came sharing God's joy and acceptance, telling stories and, and sharing feasts, these people purport to be serious seekers after God. Serious, good, religious folk. But what they are really looking for is a God made in their own image. A God who will bless the way they want to live. A, a, a God 
life who will conform to their wills, not the other way around. They are seeking a religious experience that they can control and manage. A, a religious experience that will fit conveniently and appropriately into their lifestyles. And so, of course, they reject both John's way of contrition and repentance and Jesus' way of acceptance, joy, and trust. The religious folk of Jesus' day had taken the Torah, the good and gracious teaching of God, revealing His will for His children, and turned it into a long list of do's and don'ts, of what is clean and unclean, uh, exact formulas for observances that one had to follow to the letter. They turned God's good word of, of steadfast love into a word of perpetual judgment and duty. Indeed, the, the yoke of the law had become so much dead, dry duty, weighing them down and holding them back, preventing them from enjoying their election as God's own chosen people. However, these first century Jews, the scribes and the Pharisees, were not unique in their attempt to mold religion into a way to control the way that God interacts with us human beings. This effort to bring order and manageability to the wild and surprising ways of God with His world. Indeed, down through the centuries, we have habitually sought to create systems by which we provide for ourselves some illusion of control that if we do thus and so, well, then we have God in our back pocket and all is right with the world. And woe be unto anyone who will challenge this, whether with somber repentance, which implies that we're doing something wrong, or with joyful hope and trust, which reorders our priorities and turns us away from ourselves. But of course, at some point, all our carefully constructed systems fail, no matter how cleverly we've put them together, because there's always, always a flaw in it. And that flaw is us. The Apostle Paul, in our second reading this morning, gives clear voice to this problem, our bondage to sin. No matter how good our intentions, no matter how noble our actions, everything we do, everything, from the infant's first greedy cry to the last selfish gasp for air on the deathbed, Everything is tainted by sinfulness. So of course, when God's messenger arrives, whether John the Baptist or Jesus, people will not listen. Because to listen would be to hear a call for change. And we don't like change. Because to listen would be to give up our illusion of control. God comes offering both the stringent path of repentance and reform and the liberating, joyful way of forgiveness and grace. And sinful humanity is fickle. They will have neither. As long as we believe we are in charge, even of our relationship with God, it is as if God cannot win no matter what God does. When the Apostle Paul says in Romans, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate, and again, I can will what is right, but I cannot do it, we are all forced to agree with him. Despite our best intentions, our behaviors, 
big and small, seldom fit who and what we are called to be. We, like the Apostle Paul, long to know not only why, but also how. How will we ever get off this endless cycle of of failure and guilt? Failure and guilt. How can we ever be open to what God truly desires in our lives when we cannot make our lives work out in even the most simple ways and simple intentions? The promise of the Gospel is that Jesus comes to rescue us from ourselves. And that is why Jesus can say, Come to me, all you that are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, we don't have much everyday experience with yokes, do we? I mean, seriously, when was the last time any of you plowed with a team of oxen? But for a yoke, that wooden beam that is fitted onto the shoulders of an ox to distribute the loads, for a yoke to work effectively, it has to be made especially for that animal. And when it is fitted well, the animal could do much more work with less effort. It's a little clearer in the original Greek, but an easy yoke is not necessarily a flimsy, light, non-constrained, non-constricting yoke. No. No. It is an efficient yoke. One that's made for the task. And so it could be quite substantial. But It is helpful. It allows the animal to do what it is supposed to do with greater ease. That's the point. That the yoke equips the animal to do what it needs to do. And even so, to say that Jesus' burden is light is not to say there are no expectations of his followers that everyone gets to do as he or she pleases, and that life will always be easy and bright? No. Although there are some that that hear it that way. But no. But what it means is we are no longer bound and weighed down by human rules and regulations. Even our own wrong-headed attempts at managing God and our relationships with God. We don't have to, to, to manufacture and control our experience of God. We don't have to make ourselves acceptable to God and to one another. No. In the midst of our confusion and even our despair, God comes to us in the person of His Son, Jesus of Nazareth. God comes to us and reminds us that God, not we ourselves, but that God is in control of the divine human encounter. We do not find God through our own wisdom and intelligence, and certainly not by seeking to protect and insulate ourselves from what God might be doing, like the people in our Gospel reading this morning. God finds us and reveals His very self on God's terms and in God's way. And that way is Jesus. Jesus invites us to lay our burdens down, all our self-absorbed agendas, our programs of how we expect this God whom we have tried to create in our own image will act and and, and react. 
all our schemes for making our lives work out and ourselves acceptable, to lay all of that down in surrender and take up the yoke of the gospel with Him. Now most all of you here have heard the footprint story at one time or another. A man looks back over his life reflectively and it's represented by this trail of footprints on a sandy beach. And as he looks back, he notices two sets of footprints representing himself and God. But during the most difficult times of his life, he notices that there's only one set of footprints. And so he questions God. I thought that you were always with me. And, and here, during the hardest times of my life, it seems that like I was alone. Where were you? And God replies, I am always with you. Where you saw one set of footprints, it was there that I carried you. And folks, that's what it means to be yoked with Christ. He's alongside you. Always there to help. Always there to, to shoulder the burden. So whatever sin from the past haunts your present, whatever doubt assails your spirit, whatever feelings of inadequacy and unworthiness keep you from being the fruitful, loving co-worker in the kingdom of God that you are called to be, Jesus invites you to lay that down at the foot of the cross, to leave it behind, and to accept His offer, to share in the work of the kingdom, to lose your life in order to find your life, to truly serve the One in whose obedience there is perfect freedom. Indeed, even unto us, the Savior says, Come unto me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Amen.